Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And we are joined today by the lead broadcaster for your Oakland A's. He is, as you will remember, Ken Korak. Welcome, Ken. Jim, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Ken is not going to do a seminar on how to broadcast baseball. He has a book. He's written a book about one of the greatest broadcasters of all time. It's called Holy Toledo, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic. And Ken Korak is the author. As I said, it is published by Wellstone Books, and it even has a foreword by John Miller. What a package. Well, yeah, thanks, Jim. And, uh, you know, John Miller was an interesting choice, but to me he was a clear-cut choice to do the foreword for the book because John and Bill were very close, and like me, uh, John grew up listening to Bill, so there was a profound influence that Bill had on John Miller. So I really thought that uh, he was the appropriate choice to do the foreword for the book. Now, this this is your first book, I understand? It is my first, and uh, it was a labor of love. You know, I know that's a, a cliche to mention that, Jim, and I, I, um, I've i always thought about writing a book, but to me it was a, an intimidating kind of thing just to think about and especially daunting to think about writing a book about Bill King, because as you know, here was a man who not only, as you said during the intro, was a phenomenal broadcaster, but a man of such diversity. So I had to ask myself, and I ask myself this a lot, how do you really capture Bill King? Because, uh, um, you know, the man just uh, was all over the map as far as his interests were concerned, and that's why I think he was such an interesting um, subject to write about. Well, let's let's lay out some of that diversity because it really is amazing. He was Bill King was among other things a sailor. He act, and he sailed big, like from here to Vancouver, from here to Hawaii. Correct? That's right. He and his wife, uh, his late wife Nancy, uh, the two of them sailed to Hawaii and back. Like you said, Vancouver was a a great trip for them. They actually literally sailed the Black Sea. Huh. Uh, so it's something that Bill had a great passion for kind of drew him to Sausalito. And while Bill, of course, Bill spent his entire time in the Bay Area beginning in 1958 in Sausalito, spent a lot of time out working on the boat, kind of a myth that he lived on the, the boat. That really never happened except one time uh, just for a month or two, uh, many, many, many years ago, decades ago. But they kind of drew these interesting characters to them. As you can imagine, there was quite a scene around the um, the sailing scene out in Sausalito, and Bill was very much a part of that, Jim. Good, good. And be, and he was also a lover of the arts, the opera, the ballet, uh, and he became a painter. At one point, his wife told him, stop talking about becoming a painter and start painting. That's right, because Nancy, I think, was about as stubborn as Bill. <laughs> um, and... He always talked about painting. He had a great interest in going to art museums, as you know, because we spent so much time on the road, and Bill was doing all three sports. And so going to art museums and studying art became kind of a pastime for Bill. And Nancy at one point said, I'm just tired of, of hearing you talk about it. If you, want to, if you want to do it so badly, Bill, get out of the house and go paint. And, that, um, and, and he became, Jim, as you know, because you've read the book, and yeah. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you have. If you look at the back cover of the book, it's literally a photograph of one of Bill's paintings, which is just a, a, an amazing work of art from my standpoint. A lot of people look at that and just think it's a photo, but really it is a photo of one of Bill's photo paintings. Photo of one of his and, paintings, yeah. yeah and you had mentioned uh, the ballet and the opera, a real patron of the arts from that standpoint, served on the board of directors of the Smulin Ballet. So, um, you know, the man, uh, Renaissance man of the mic, it's kind of a cliche even to mention that. Uh, but he really, he really was a Renaissance man. There, there, there was a, a basketball player that uh, he became very friendly with, and that friendship uh, grew out of their uh, mutual love of, of, of poetry. Tom Mascheri, and Tom, whose real name is Russian, and I don't want to try what Tom is in Russian. Uh, it, I, I guess, kind of uh, got Bill uh, into the whole business of Russian literature. Right. Of course, Tom, with his uh, Russian heritage, and he uh, moved to San Francisco as a young boy, grew up in the city, wound up a, a great collegiate basketball player at St. Mary's, and, of course, on to the, actually, the Philadelphia Warriors came west with the Warriors with Will Chamberlain. 
uh, when the Warriors actually were born in San Francisco in 1962. He was part of that team. He actually played in Chamberlain's 100-point game in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Hershey, but, Pennsylvania, uh, wow. Right. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, they became great friends. And Tom told me in a wonderful interview for the book, Jim, that Bill King was the brother he never had. Uh, and so Tom had a profound influence on Bill, really in all things Russian, because Bill, one thing about Bill, once he got into something, he totally immersed himself in it. There was nothing that was halfway about Bill. And so he became really an expert on uh, Russian history, Russian uh, the Russian heritage, Russian culture. And actually, uh, with Tom and Sherry's help, uh, Bill learned how to speak Russian as well. But beyond all of those things, Bill King was a man of the radio. And you write that with radio, you were connected to the action in a way that was more immediate and more intimate. And it gave you a, a, a chance to conjure up your own images. You were talking there, contrasting radio with TV. Mm -hmm. And and then you go on to uh, quote Roy Eisenhart, the, the A's president at the time, I think. Your job as the announcer, he said, is to help me use my imagination. Well, and then, you know, Roy was such a, a wonderful person uh, for me to talk to for the book, and, and one of several bosses of Bill who really understood Bill, Jim, and, and kind of let Bill be himself because, uh, um, you know, Bill was, was a man who was governed by his passions, as I said, and lived life on his own terms. And there were people like Roy in Bill's life and Franklin Muley beginning in 62, mm -hmm. Al Davis, who really understood Bill and I think also understood Bill's preference for working on radio, although Bill did quite a bit of television, uh, but during the entire yeah. time that we worked together. It was, it, it um, was always putting captions right. on pictures. Exactly. That's what it is. That's hey, right. Holy Toledo is in the best sense of the word, a tell-all book. And we're going to prove that when we return. Holy Toledo, that's what's on my mind. Bill King's, one of his favorite expressions. That's the title of a wonderful book uh, written by Ken Korak as a subtitle, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic, published by Wellstone Books, with a foreword by a fellow who's a pretty fair broadcaster himself, John Miller. You know, John Miller wins prizes. Everybody wins prizes. And you spend a whole chapter telling us why Bill King doesn't win prizes. And I don't accept it. I think it's baloney. Yeah, well, they just, uh, Jim, earlier this month, uh, had the naming of the Ford C. Frick Award winner Yeah, um, for uh, baseball broadcasting, the Baseball Hall of Fame. And Eric Nadell of the Texas Rangers was very deserving, but we have felt for many, many years that Bill is extremely deserving and that uh, his selection is long overdue. And I did try to make the case for that uh, during the book, but you mentioned Roy Eisenhardt, and Roy said something I thought was very interesting, that kind of ironically, the fact that was that Bill was so brilliant in all three sports, mm -hmm. broadcasting the Raiders, the Warriors, and the A's, the quote, I think, was that his multiversity of talents might have worked against him in terms of the Frick Award because he just wasn't solely identified with baseball. But if you think, Jim, he was the number one broadcaster for the A's for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about having written this book and the aftermath of it, 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 just hearing from so many people who were touched by Bill, mm -hmm. if you define for me a Hall of Fame career, would be someone who made a huge impact in his or her market. And Bill King made that kind of impact. He had that kind of imprint. He meant that much to people. And to me, that uh, just kind of defines what a Hall of Famer is all about. That's the way I see it. But the other thing that you raise in that in that chapter as as a problem is that uh, if you will, he had no uh, national podium. He did all his broadcasting from here about the teams from here, and and this is you know the other coast. That's right, and that was his choice too. Um, he had no interest in working nationally. I'm sure he had opportunities to work on national broadcasts, but Bill didn't need that kind of validation. He didn't need someone to say, well, you have to go to New York to justify your career. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bill was very confident, very comfortable in his own shoes, and what he wanted to do is work as a local broadcaster, and he found great fulfillment in that. 
And you had mentioned uh, radio kind of versus television. Yeah. And he was a radio guy. He, he really felt that on television, and this isn't to disparage anybody who does TV, but he felt that on television you were just an instrument of the director. But that on radio, you really kind of drive in the car. You're the eyes and ears of the audience. And, and Bill lived for those moments because describing the action, that's really what Bill lived for. And he just felt like um, that wasn't available to him doing television. Let, uh, let us share one of those descriptions you have in the book of the action. This is the 75 Warriors basketball team. He's thrown Addles out of the game. This is disgraceful. This is disgraceful. Al Adels has been ejected. <laughs> the Warriors are going crazy. Cliff Ray started after Powers. Richie Powers has just committed, I think, the most disgraceful decision, and I love this line, of a very distinguished officiating career. I cannot believe this. Yeah, well, that was game four of the uh, 1975 NBA Finals, and that was in the aftermath of the incident between Mike Reardon and Rick Barry. Al Adels, of course, gets kicked out of the game. He watches the uh, end of the first half and, of course, the entire second half of the game on a television monitor in the Warriors' locker room at the uh, dingy Cap Center out in Landover, Maryland. Uh -huh. And, of course, it was one of the greatest upsets in the history of the NBA Finals as the Warriors swept the Bullets, a star-studded team uh, from our nation's capital. And although... Uh, Bill mentioned this to me and talked about it many times, that baseball was his first love. Um, that was his favorite team, the 1975 Warriors, no question. Okay. Uh, the favorite team for Bill King. Now, uh, in, in terms of, of not doing what you were expected to do, uh, there is a, a woman by the name of Susan Fornoff, a former A's beat writer, who says this of Mr. King. Bill King was such a character... A, a cultured man, yet on a hot day, he'd be almost naked in the radio booth. Huh? Is that true? Almost <laughs> naked in the radio booth? Well, one of the people I interviewed for the, the book was Rich Murata, who was uh, Bill's partner when the Raiders played in Los Angeles. Of course, mm -hmm. all those years, Bill went down to L.A. and broadcast the Raiders, and they were um, broadcasting the Super Bowl. And Rich shows up in a tuxedo, and Bill <laughs> takes off his pants, and he's got the speedos and the um, and the flip flops, the signature flip flops on his feet. So here was Bill in speedos, and they're doing the Super Bowl, and Rich is in a tuxedo. So, um, yeah, those were one of the, you know that was just one of the kind of quirky aspects of uh, Bill King. Another thing was. His eating habits. Now, there is an entire chapter, as you know, Jim, in the book yes, on, and that, on Bill's uh, eating. Now, who would do no, that? Now, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's most important about that chapter is its title, Tortillas with Onions and Peanut Butter. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, who would do that? Who would write a biography about somebody? But um, I've got a lot of feedback on that chapter. Uh, <laughs> I'll bet I you I think there's some kind of humorous elements to that because... Let's face it, um, Bill Ashley was an aficionado of fine dining, and he could go out to the finest restaurant in the country and get dressed up, look as, as dapper as could be, white tablecloth and, and all that, and then he would have Cheetos for breakfast and a Diet Coke. And so I said to him, I, I said, Bill, and, you know, we were in Anaheim, he would go to the little taqueria and have a calves brain taco and a Dos Equis for breakfast, and then go out to the finest restaurant anywhere uh, that evening for dinner, and I said, Bill, how can you do this to your system? And he said, well, I eat a well-balanced diet. I just eat everything. Uh, <laughs> 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 There's a very deep side to, uh, to, to Bill King, uh, and you have a section of the book which are like comments from various uh, uh, people, players and, uh, and writers. And there's a, a quote from Dave Henderson. Down in the valley, he says, remember, there were farmers and workers that didn't have the money to go to the games, so they listened on the radio. They equated Oakland A's baseball with Bill King. If they heard his voice, baseball was going on, and it was summertime, and everything was rosy. He gave everybody that feeling. Yes, he did. That yeah. everything was okay. Bill was on the radio Nice warm day, baseball was going, everything was fine, 
in the world. And in the romantic sense of what we do, Jim, on the air, Bill was a member of the family. And I think that, that quote from Dave Henderson goes right to that. And plus, we've talked a lot, uh, a lot on the show today about all of Bill's interests. Yeah. And those things are extremely interesting, and they were very important for me to write about in the book. But the bottom line is, Bill King was a professional broadcaster, and nothing that he did ever compromised his dedication to that. And he was so ardent about that and so involved in his preparation. Um, he had all these other interests, but as Scotty Sterling said in the book, none of that would ever compromise his dedication and his preparation. Well, all, um, he all worked, I he can just say, worked so hard at all that. All I can say to all of that again is, holy Toledo. We've so much more to share and only one segment to do it in, so stay tuned. A longtime broadcaster, first-time author, Ken Korak, is our guest today, and he's talking about a book that you'll love if you have the sense to go buy it. It's called Holy Toledo, Lessons from Bill King, a Renaissance Man of the Mic, by Ken Korak, published by Wellstone Books, with a foreword by John Miller. One of the wonderful things in this book is, uh, towards the very end of it, uh, various people make comments about uh, Bill King. And I'd like it if you would share with us the comments of one Marcos Breton, Sacramento Bee columnist. Well, thank you, Jim. Here was the quote from uh, Marcos. Uh, Bill King is more revered today because we took him for granted when he was still with us. He didn't flaunt his excellence, so we didn't praise him enough for it. Our memories are tied to his voice and his descriptions of indelible moments in sports history. But those memories wouldn't be as thrilling or indelible without Bill's voice and the spontaneous majesty he brought to each description of each game year after year. Bill erased the distance between the listener and the action. He made you feel the games in your gut, your heart, and your mind. His basketball calls, perhaps his best sport, were like machine gun blasts of raw energy. His football calls were brimming with drama to match the pulsating essence of NFL football as a violent chess match. In baseball, Bill was the storyteller, the wise sage, the brilliant uncle. Only now, in his absence, have we realized that no one, no one else could match his peerless skills. His legacy lives in our memories. We can recite his calls years after he left us. He can make us smile even now. I miss Bill, but I can still hear him, and I will for as long as I live. It's beautiful, I think. It really is, yeah. yeah that's, just, that's beautiful. So indebted to all these people who were so gracious with their time to, yeah. to help us with the project. Let's uh, get to some of those calls. Spend a few minutes in that direction, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, the first one is... Uh, I have in my notes, Ricky Henderson steals base number 939, reported by Bill King, thanks to the kindness of one Lon Simmons. That's right. And, and Bill and Lon started working together on the A's broadcast in 1981, which really was a stroke of genius by uh, Roy Eisenhardt and the rest of the A's front office, because as you know, Jim, the A's organization had really reached a, a very low point at the end of the Charlie Finley ownership, and uh, not only Roy, but Andy Dolich uh, said that the pairing of Bill and Lon, I think, was perhaps the most important thing that ownership did to reestablish credibility for that for the A's in the Bay Area. And so it was Lon's inning, and this just speaks to Lon and, and the class that Lon had and, and, I guess, the selflessness of Lon Simmons, and that is that um, Ricky Henderson stole second base. He needed to steal third base to set the all-time record, and it was Lon's inning. He was doing the play-by-play. -play. He gave up the play-by-play -play to Bill King so that Bill would have the chance to make that call. And seamlessly, Bill took over the play-by-play -play and called it as if he had done the entire inning. It's really remarkable to think that Lon said, you know, Bill, you take it. Um, he said something like, Bill, your calls have been in the halls of fame in football and basketball. Maybe now it's time for one for baseball. They both had the sense that Ricky was going to try to steal a third base, which he did, and Bill um, broadcast that stolen base like he had been doing the entire inning. It really was remarkable. Well, that's what happens when you put two great guys in a booth together. Right, and, and Wonderful things not, like that. 
right, and Lon didn't have an ego about something like yeah. that, and it, it speaks to, like I said, the class, and, and it was, there was, all, there was, there was a, a chapter in the book, Jim, as you know, on the A's 20-game winning streak, yeah. and the fact that Bill was just so gracious to me, uh, put his ego aside when he was on vacation, um, and didn't come back to the, the, the booth. When some of his friends were saying, you need to be at the Coliseum because the A's are about to set an American League record for most consecutive wins, and the ninth inning is the ninth inning of, uh, it's the inning of record when so many amazing things happen. And Bill said, no, I've committed to taking that time off, and those ninth innings belong to Ken. Um, when a lot of uh, people, I think, in our business would have come back and, uh, and canceled their vacation plans. Well, I think you're right. I think you're right. How about talking a little bit uh, concerning <laughs> the Holy Roller, Oakland Raiders versus, I guess, San Diego? Get your big butt off the field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one of his most famous calls. And, and Jim, Bill's calls will live forever through NFL films. Um, so many of those amazing Raider moments, regular season, postseason, Super Bowls, uh, Marcus Allen's incredible run in the Super Bowl, but... Um, uh, among the 55 or 60 people that I interviewed, I don't know that I was more thrilled to have the chance to interview John Madden. And, uh, you know, he talked about his reaction to that call. Um, and just how back in those days with the Raiders, they were a family. And, and they, you know, one of the interesting things about Madden was that not only was he this wonderful coach, but he was an incredible analyst, maybe the most heralded or decorated analyst in the history of the National Football League. Yeah, and, and he, he and, credits and, and, Bill. And and he says, give this to Bill. Bill right. taught Madden preparation. That's right. And what an amazing thing for someone like John Madden to say yeah. about Bill King. Yeah, really amazing. And then there was the uh, 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 the one in, involving the Warriors, which we I think we brought we up mentioned, before, right. with uh, Richie Powers. Right, and then, of course, he. Um, there's a chapter in the book that's titled Mother's Day, and I think that this would be it would be the end of our respective careers if we actually said over the air what Bill said. Um, suffice to say, it was an X-rated barrage when Bill didn't realize that his crowd mic was on. Um, Seattle in December of 1968, and uh, there's an entire chapter on that incident. There's a lot of mythology that has kind of grown from that incident. We kind of set the record straight um, in that chapter as well. Well, that's good because everybody was saying they didn't know how it happened until afterwards, and then they were all experts. Right, exactly. You know, where was the mic in which the terrible thing went out over the air? And nobody knew until it got a little old. Then everybody knew. I want. I, I heard it. I was there below. Right. And Ed Rush was the recipient of the barrage. He mm -hmm. was the official. And I interviewed him for the book, and um, he was so kind, Jim, to spend that time with me. And... and Bill had a thing for authority figures, so uh, basketball officials and um, baseball umpires were frequent targets of Bill. Yeah. And Ed Rush was a frequent target, but they actually became friendly as the years went on. And I asked Ed about that incident in Seattle in 1968, and he was so humble and so honest and forthcoming when he said, I've got to be honest with you, I didn't have a very good night. I wasn't very good that night. So no resentment, no bitterness that here I was, you know, kind of, digging into something that was a very uncomfortable night, of course, in his life, and, it, and 45 years had passed. But um, it was really cool to talk to him. I think that that kind of illustrates for me one of the great virtues of the way Bill King did things, and that would be, in my judgment, head on. Mm -hmm. Get at it, say what you think needs to be said, be honest, and be done. And that was the way he lived his life. And I think that's why he was so enduring and so endearing, I guess, um, Jim, because it was real. I think when people listen to Bill King on the radio, they got a sense that this was authentic. Mm -hmm. um, there was no pretense there. Bill wasn't trying to conform to somebody else's standards of how he thought or how they thought he should perform as a broadcaster. Bill King was going to do it his way. And I think that authenticity and that, and the fact, obviously the fact that he was a cultured man, that yeah. he had all these other interests, and I said this at Bill's memorial service, that all of his other interests added a texture to his broadcast. So there was a depth to Bill King that I think 
people really picked up on here in the Bay Area, and I think that's one of the reasons why he was so special. And there's a depth to this book. It is called Holy Toledo, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic. The author is Ken Korak. This has been Conversations on the Coast.